الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أسك الله تجيب التوفيق الإيمان and that he protects us wherever we may be and that Allah سبحانه وتعالى takes us in a state of iman and that he is pleased with us and not angered with us when we leave this dunya we are now on page uh, 145 from the book of Ibn Hajar, Badr al-Ma'un fi Fadl al-Ta'un, a small act of goodness in explaining the virtues of plagues and pandemics uh, with the Islamic perspective. And we are now on the fourth lesson, and the author in today's session, inshallah, is going to complete what we started last time in talking about uh, the effects of those people who die. And as you can see on the screen here in Arabic, he is going to explain, or today we're going to begin by the explanation of the statement of the Prophet Shahada, every single one of them that dies as a, as, a, as a consequence of the plague and the pandemic, they will have a Shahada and they will be, have a level of martyrdom that has been recorded for them. But also, like we said in the introduction of this book in our first lesson, the book has been categorized well, it seems that the author Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, rahimahullah, has categorized the book into segments. So what we are going to look at today, and we're going to complete, inshallah, today, is the whole first segment, which is what is a ta'un, what is a plague and a pandemic, why do they come about, the effects of the jinn and the shayateen in that, and the result of those people who die, uh, what happens to them and inshallah we will begin the second sort of segment which is what is the cure what is the solution what is the way out what are some of the ways that you can protect yourself and inshallah this is what we'll be looking at in this session today so as you can see here the statement of the prophet sallallahu uh, everyone who dies as a consequence of this pandemic they will have a level of martyrdom written for them. Now, the question that the author is asking here is that, is everyone that dies as a consequence of the pandemic be accepted as being a shaheed? Is everyone? hukmu. What if there is a person who is a fasik? What if there is a person who is a sinner and he dies as a consequence of the plague? He's a Muslim, but he has some issues in his iman, etc. Will he then be considered as a shaheed? How can a fasik and a sinner be accepted as being a shaheed? So this is the question. Wa'ani bil fasik murtakab al kabir, a person who is connected to a major sin, and that's what he means by that. So the question is, is that will everybody be accepted as being a martyr? And he says in a general sense, yes. In a general sense, anybody who dies, and he is a Muslim, he will die as being a martyr. However, however, we will clarify, if not in this session, but the next, how a person can... Uh, ascertain for himself that he has been accepted as being a shaheed because there will be some people that will die and they will not be accepted as being shaheed and this is the point that he is making but in a general sense, yes but in order for a person to qualify to be in that general sense he needs to have a certain characteristics and they're going to be explained in further detail like I said further on in the book but he will allude to them uh on the next page. But here we're going to say, فَإِنَّهُ يُقَالُ It could be said that such people will, as in the Fasics and the people who are connected to shirk and major sins and nifaq, etc. and they have a very poor connection to Allah and a very weak level of iman, that these people will not attain the daraja or the level of being a martyr. This is because Allah says in the Quran here in Surah Al Ankabut, "Am hasib al nas ashtarahu al sayyad al najarahum kaladina amanu wa amanu salihati sawa amahiyahum wa matum sa amahiyahum." 
This is not in Surah Al-Kaput, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in this ayah here, do those people who are uh, accumulating for themselves sin, that they will be treated the same as those who believe and do good deeds? Are they the same in their lives and in their deaths? How terrible do you make your judgment then? So the author is saying here that we have to understand that in order for a person to be accepted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have that level of uh, virtue and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepting him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing him to get closer to him, there has to be certain characteristics. It is not that the fact that a person dies within a, spe a particular space or a time or a location or generation and because of the time that he died in or the place that he died in, or the manner perhaps that he died in, that doesn't necessarily dictate his position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is his iman, and it is his actions, and it is his intentions, which would then qualify him as being as such. But like we're saying here, the author is saying, as you can probably see here at the top of your screen, أَطَّعُونَ شَهَادَ لِكُلِّ مُسْلِمْ a person, a Muslim who dies as a consequence of these plagues and pandemics, then this is a martyrdom for him. So he says, This is general, this is clearly general statement from the Prophet ﷺ. However, what I use them in Surah Durajan, Liman Sayyad, and Yusawi Mu'min. However, what we have to highlight that the, the person who is engaged in major sins, a person and Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah says, Sayyid uh, can refer to minor sins also. That a person, basically, in the sense of uh, he is weak in his iman, he will not qualify for those characteristics. May Allah protect us. And then he goes on to make this point further clear that the person who Dies as a shaheed is a person who strives for the sake of Allah. Whether that's in himself, whether that's in his community, whether that's for his country, as in the sense of for the sake of uh, the Muslim ummah, to make the word of Allah the highest. Therefore, a person will not attain in his death if he hasn't achieved that as a intention and a characteristic for himself. But then the author says, Ibn Hajar, Rahimahullah, Naam, Sabbath al Hadith Sahih, yes, there is an authentic hadith and the Shaheed, Yukfar Allahu Kulladam. Now we can understand that a person could be a, a sinner, and he is then, from this hadith, the Prophet said that the person who dies as a Shaheed, his sins are forgiven. So could, could it be then and be understood that the person who dies as a Shaheed, he was connected to major sins and he had a weakness in his iman, but because of the state that he died in, he will then be forgiven because of his sins, because of the way that he passed away. And there is this narration here, وَيُغْفَرْ لِشَهِيدُ الْبَرِّ الذُّنُوبُ كُلَّهَا إِلَّا الدَّيْنِ وَلِشَهِيدُ الْبَحْرِ الذُّنُوبُ الدَّيْنِ but this narration is weak, but the point that he's making here, that the person who dies as a, as a, as a shaheed, they are of different levels. So in this narration here, which is weak, but has been accepted by some of the ulama as a general understanding, is that the shaheed who dies on, or a person who dies trying to uh, establish the religion of Allah on the land, all of his sins will be forgiven except for the debt. However, the debt that he leaves behind. However, if a person dies in trying to promote the religion of Allah or establish justice within Allah's creation and he dies as a consequence of that, then all of his sins will be forgiven, even the debt that he has left behind. And the point that he is making here, Rahimahullah, is that a person, in order for him to get the shahada, like we've said, there needs to be certain characteristics, but also 
that they are of different levels. However, can it now be understood that the person who is connected to sins will be expiated for his sins for the sake of him being included as being a martyr? Meaning, he is then being accepted by Allah as being a martyr, therefore, even his major sins, etc., will all be then forgiven. The author makes it very clear that the Sharia gives virtues to people who have certain characteristics. And in this particular hadith of the martyr being forgiven except for the debt, what we can derive from this, as we're saying here on this page with this paragraph here, is that the person might be accepted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being a shaheed, but if he has some sins behind, that he has left behind, if he has left behind some kind of negligence or sin or the rights of others, that will not be accepted. And he will not be forgiven. And that will not qualify him as being a shaheed. So this is a very important point that the author is making here, and this is definitely the situation that we're living in. I mean, hundreds are dying now, and thousands around the world. Are the Muslims of them, all of them, included as being shaheed? If we die as a consequence, may Allah preserve, we will be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with martyrdom or not. The author is making it clear that the Sharia gives virtue to certain characteristics, and even the people who have died on the battlefield, even they are not guaranteed martyrdom if they have left behind uh, the rights of others. And what we learn from that is that if a person doesn't have certain characteristics, then he may not qualify as being a shaheed. And like we said a moment ago, it's very important because the ulama highlight that it's not about the way that a person dies. Because sometimes a person... I mean, generally, we can see that there are good signs that the way that a person dies, but we are not 100% sure because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best about that person's state in the way that they died. So the ulama have mentioned the person might die and it may appear as if the person has died in a pious state, but it might not necessarily be with that the case with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point we're making here is that husn al-khatima, a good end, cannot always be something which is obvious. So if a person dies as a consequence of a plague, but he's lived a life where he is far away from Allah, it is not conceivable for a person who has a good understanding of Islam to say that this person has died as being a shaheed because he hasn't qualified for those characteristics. However, we cannot categorically say either way. والحاصل أن الوجود تبعات لا يمنع حصول الشهادة and this is what the author is saying here in a general sense it doesn't necessarily mean that a person who is weak who's got sins etc and he dies as a consequence of the pandemic that he will not be accepted as being a shaheed this is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala however the shari' the legislator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala قد رتب الثواب على صفة معينة Allah has given us Plenty of proofs and evidences from the Kitab and the Sunnah that these rewards are for those who have certain characteristics. فَإِنْ حَصَلَتْ الْمُؤْمِنْ in the motive That if a person who is a believer dies in a particular way with these characteristics, حَصَلَ لَهُ ذَلِكَ الثواب. Then he has attained for himself that reward. فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهُ وَإِحْسَانًا this is a bounty and a grace and a goodness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill his promise to those people. Allah will not ever contradict his promise. And the shahada, and we we're going to cover this later on. What is the shahada? He's got a particular chapter on that, particular area in the book where he discusses what a shahada and what a shaheed actually is, what is a martyr and what is martyrdom. However, what he is saying here, that the martyrdom that is granted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a reward and it is a 
a bounty and a grace and a way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honoring the person who is coming to him in death. Can that be given to anybody? The answer is quite clearly no. And then the author goes on to explain that a little bit further. وَقَدْ بَيِّنَ الْحَدِيثَ أَنَّهُ يَكْثُرُ ذُنُوبِهِ مُتَعَلِّكَ بِحُقُوكِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَيْتَجَاوَزَ أَنَهُ الْإِخْلَالِ بِهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the bounty that he grants to those people who die as a shaheed is that if he has a connection with Allah and he has some kind of weakness in his connection with Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expiate it for that person. However, like we have seen before, the author has made it clear that these uh, weaknesses and these sins do not fall under the category of being major sin and they do not fall under the category of those people taking the rights of other people, taking their money and not returning it, taking their honor and not fulfilling it and taking word, their word and not, you know, following it through. وَلَا يَلْزِمْ مِنْ حُصُولُ الشَّهَادِ سُقُوتُ حُقُوكُ الْعِبَادِ فَإِنْ عَدِمْ فَإِنْ عُدِمَ بَقَاءِ الشَّيْءِ مِنْ تَبَعَاتُ الْسَالِمْ مِنْ الدَّيْنِ إِنَّمَا هُوَ مِنْ دُرُورِ الْوَاقِعِ لَا مِنْ جِزَاءِ الشَّهَادَةِ the author is now saying here that the person who has died as a consequence of the pandemic, it doesn't necessarily mean that the rights of other people are foregone because of that. And that a person may be prevented because of that, and a person would then still have to complete the rights that he must give towards other people. So what we learn from here is that just because a person has died in a particular way, or even if he has died as a shaheed, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, all of his sins will be forgiven, perhaps, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has told us through his Prophet وسلم, that if they have left behind the rights of other people, uh, they may not be forgiven. And what we are learning from this is that not every single person will then be granted as being a shaheed. And what we learn from this is that a person cannot be relaxed in his connection with Allah and the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his life. And by extension, the rights of other people as well. And what we also learn is that a person from this may be deceived by what is happening to him in his life. It could be that a person is affected with an illness or a test or a calamity. It could be that a person is being oppressed. It could be that a whole group of Muslims are being oppressed around the world. It could be that a person has been afflicted, afflicted by the illness and the pandemic, etc. And what we learn from what the author is saying here, Rahimahullah, is that a person could be affected by this, but then at the same time, he's deceiving himself. And how many of them are there where they see the state of the ummah and they see the state of themselves also, but they think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them and they take it for granted and they carry on with their life of sinning and their life of not fulfilling the wajibat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a life of negligence. And then they become happy and they rejoice that something has happened against the oppressor or the oppressed. And they think that it is from Allah. However, it might not necessarily be a cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aiding them. It could be, as the author is quite clearly telling us within these pages here, is that there are a group of people who will be accepted with Allah without any reckoning and without any punishment. They will be martyrs with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, 
we need to have certain characteristics in our lives in order for the person to qualify as being a shaheed. And it is not everybody who says La ilaha illallah that will be accepted with Allah as being a shaheed. Then the author moves on to another very important question is that as we have seen in the previous lecture that it could be that pandemics and plagues are a result of the handiworks of the of the jinn and specifically the shayateen. The question now is how can this occur? How can pandemics and plagues occur during the month of Ramadan? Because we know that during the month of Ramadan, as the hadith is quoting here, that the shayateen are locked up. The hadith where the Prophet have said that the, uh, the shayateen are chained up when the Ram month of Ramadan begins. So how is it possible that if the pandemic and the plague has been caused by the shayateen, how is it possible that these plagues and pandemics continue during the month of Ramadan? Tajuddin al-Subki, one of the ulama of the Shafi'is, he said, Rahimahullah, that what the hadith means works min min al jinn that this is a gust and a, and a and a piercing from the enemies from the jinn it refers to something that occurs before ramadan and the effects continue after ramadan so now the waqs here refers to a piercing and a and a blow from the the, the shayateen and if someone hits another person, it could be that the effects and the injury remains for a long time. So Tajuddin Subhi Rahimullah is saying that there is no contradiction because the affliction occurs before they have been chained up. Another possible explanation in understanding how this comes about is that he also said that the consequences and the punishment can occur in Ramadan. So the consequences of what has come about from these shayateen happened before Ramadan, but the punishment finally settles in in Ramadan. So now, for example, a person has been affected by something in Ramadan from the shayateen, but the consequence and the punishment comes about during Ramadan in the sense that uh, the actual punishment began before. And it's similar to what he said uh, earlier, but, but it's slightly different in the sense that he's talking about the consequence and the effect of it. However, what he was saying before is that the punishment starts off before and it continues into Ramadan. However, the second possible explanation that he is giving here is that the consequence and the punishment occur before Ramadan and then they continue into Ramadan in the sense that it isn't something which befalls a person in Ramadan as a consequence of something that happened before Ramadan. Whereas the first explanation that he gave is that it's something started before Ramadan and it continues into Ramadan. Others from the ulama, such as وَقَدْ تَكَلَّمَ الْعُلَمَاء قَدِيمًا عَلَى هَذِي مَسْأَلَى The author is saying here, others from the ulama, such as Al-Halimi and uh, Ibn Khuzayma and Qurtubi, have mercy on them all, and this is now on the next page. And he says that we've mentioned this in Fatul Bari also, have said that there is no contradiction because the shayateen being locked and chained up in, in Ramadan doesn't necessarily mean that all of the shayateen are locked up. So it could be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows for some shayateen to remain and they are the ones that spread around this fitna.
It is also said here in the middle of the page, and it could be that the meaning and the way that we can reconcile all of this, and the shayateen, is that in Ramadan the effect of creating fitna against the Muslims is lessened but not for the rest of the dunya not for the rest of those people who will also be affected so the chaining of the shayateen and this is similar to what uh, others have mentioned, such as Qadi Ayad, as the author mentions on the next page. But this is here what Ibn Khuzayma said, and he's using uh, the hadith of the Prophet in Ida Kana Awal Laylam in Shahr Ramadan. When the first night of Ramadan begins, Sufi that Shayateen be Ghayri Ghayid. So Shayateen are locked up without any kind of release. So now, Ibn Khuzayma rahimahullah is saying here also the same as Halim is that uh, it doesn't necessarily mean all of the shayateen are locked up. But Qadi Ayyad rahimahullah, uh, he said in his explanation of Sahih Muslim that, and this is similar to what Halim was saying a moment ago, is that uh, a group of uh, shayateen will be locked up. But there will be other shayateen that are allowed to let loose and those shayateen will create corruption and fitna against the kuffar but not against the believers. So this hadith is actually showing the virtue of the believers of this ummah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a favor for this ummah during the month of Ramadan may Allah allow us to see and benefit from it is that they will be chained up to stop people from sinning or beautify their sinning for the people of Iman so that they can attain more rewards whilst the doors of Jannah are made wide open. And Qurtubi, in his explanation of Sahih Muslim, also he said that the hadith is quite clear and we take it in its apparent meaning that the shayateen are locked up. But then he asks the question in his explanation of Muslim, then how come if the shayateen are locked up, how come there is so much evil that occurs that we witness during the month of Ramadan also? He said the response to that is that they are locked up for the people who are fasting so that they can fulfill the Sawm Mu'tabar bi shuruti wa mara'at adabih They can complete the conditions of fasting and they will have the proper etiquettes and manners during the people during the month of Ramadan for those people who are fasting And this is similar to what Qadi was saying in the previous paragraph in the sense that what the hadith means is that they are a blessing the shayateen being locked up is a blessing for the ummah that believe and are practicing the rituals of Ramadan by fasting and standing and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Hajar rahimahullah in the conclusion of that, uh, of that dilemma or that problematic area of how to reconcile. He said, فَالْجَوَابْ أَنَّهَا إِنَّمَا تَغُلْ أَمَّنْ سَوْمْ That's what Qadir Ayah said. He's saying here, وَالْمُؤْتَمَلْ الْإِحْتِمَالْ الثَّانِي Ibn Hajar Rahimahullah is saying here that the opinion that he goes with is what he thinks is likely, and this is what he mentioned in Fatwa Bari himself, in explanation of Sayyid Bukhari, is that what Halimi and Ibn Khuzayma are called to be said which is that uh, it is not a total chaining that the shayateen are locked up, but they are not completely locked up. And it is that some shayateen are allowed to still carry on and operate as normal. And with that, then we can understand that plagues can 
uh, occur and continue during the month of Ramadan. However, there is a very important principle that we need to understand here, which is that if the ulama have differed on a particular issue and there is no way or there is no reason why we cannot reconcile and say all of them are likely and there is a possibility that all of them can be accepted, then there is no harm in us saying, yes, all of them can be accepted. So now, a subki, if we go back to what he said, he said that the plague starts before Ramadan and continues into Ramadan, similar to the situation that we're in. Or it could be that the consequences occur before Ramadan and the punishment befalls in Ramadan, that is also possible. Does that contradict what Al-Halim and Ibn Khuzaym and Qutbi said? No, because they've said that not all the shayateen are locked up. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a contradiction. And then we have what Qadi says at the bottom, or the third possible opinion, is that the shayateen are locked up for the believers so that they can then fulfill the month of Ramadan in the best possible behavior without kind of having any kind of influence from the shayateen and wasawis. Therefore, Ibn Hajar rahimullah is saying what seems to be most likely is that not all of the shayateen are locked up. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is any kind of obvious contradiction. al fasl al-Sadis, the sixth chapter. What's the hikmah behind jinn causing these plagues and pandemics? Dhikr al-Dalil, anna jinn qad sallatoon al-ins bi ghayr al-wakhs fi Ramadan wa fi ghayrih that there is evidence the author is going to bring those evidences in this chapter that the gust and the, and, and the attack from the shayateen can happen and it could affect the, the, the humankind in Ramadan and before Ramadan فَلَا يَسْتَنْكُرُ تَسْلِيتِهِمْ بِالْوَخْسِ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَانَ قَدْ يَدْفَ بَعْدُهُمْ أَمْ بَعْدِهِمْ This doesn't necessarily mean, and this is now following on from that previous uh, question, which is that how can they occur in Ramadan when the shayateen is supposed to be locked up? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the author is saying here, that they can still continue, and it might even get worse. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect the believers. And from this we can then understand, and the author is going to mention some of the statements of the ulama in talking about why or what the hikmah behind uh, what some of the ulama have mentioned of this hadith actually is. The fact that the Prophet ﷺ has said that these plagues and pandemics can be caused by an attack from the jinn. But here the author is now mentioning the hadith of Safiya bin Huyay. May Allah be pleased with her, our mother, Umm Mu'mineen, that she went to visit the Messenger of Allah ﷺ during his i'tiqaf. And she sat with him and she discussed whatever she wanted to discuss. She was visiting her husband during the i'tiqaf. And then when she wanted to leave, the Prophet ﷺ stood with her and he walked her towards her home. And he saw two men from the Ansar. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, alerting them and saying that this is my wife, Safiya, and I'm the Messenger of Allah. And the Ansar said, yeah, SubhanAllah, Ya Rasul, how is it possible that we can have any, ever bad thoughts about you? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then said, In Shaytan, Yajri min Ibn Adam, Majrad Dam. The Shaytan flows inside the son of Adam, inside of man, like the flowing of blood. Now the author is mentioning this hadith to say that wasawis and bad thoughts and the influence of shaitan and jinn upon mankind are plenty and they can even continue into Ramadan. And remember the chapter or the title of this chapter here is that uh, what are some of the proofs that the shayateen and the jinn specifically can overcome mankind, even in Ramadan, even outside Ramadan. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect the believers. And from this we will then understand the hikmah 
specifically in the next chapter, out of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows for the shayateen to attack mankind with these plagues and pandemics. There is another hadith that the author brings here, Inna shaytan kuhlan wa that the shaytan has a kuhl, what you apply to your eye, the ithmid. And he has a la'uq, and a la'uq is saliva. Shaytan has a kuhl, and he has saliva. فَإِذَا كَهَلَ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ كُهْلِهِ شَغَلَهُ عَنِ الصَّلَاةِ If he applies his kuhl upon a person, he will then become somebody who is distracted in his salah. Maybe not establishing it, or maybe not establishing it correctly. وَإِذَا لَعَكَهُ مِنْ لَعُوكِهِ ذَرَبَ لِسَانِهِ فِي الشَّرِ And if the shaytan afflicts the person from Bani Adam with his saliva, then his tongue will be used in evil and corruption. The author and this hadith is trying to make it clear to us that the shaytan can have an influence upon Bani Adam, whether it's inside of Ramadan or outside of Ramadan. However, as we've seen from the hadith of Safiya bin Tuyay and this hadith here, it requires a level of a person removing the influence of shaitan in his life in order for him then to be defended by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even after he has taken all the necessary means to protect himself, and this is inshallah what we will look at perhaps now even in the next lecture, if anything befalls him beyond that, then it could be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to have mercy upon him. And that is also going to come later on in the book as to why uh, our plagues and pandemics are mercy upon this ummah when the Prophet said in a separate hadith that it's an adab. But this particular hadith here about the kuhl being placed in the eyes of Bani Adam and the saliva being placed in the mouth of Bani Adam and this is how the shaitan controls the person has an influence on him. This hadith has been made supported by Ibn Hajar rahimahullah. However, others from the ulama have said that this hadith is weak and some of them said that they're extremely weak. And what I could find for myself is that this hadith has two chains to it. And one of the chains has a person called Hakam ibn Abdul Malik al Qurashi and he is Da'if. And the other chain has another person called Sayyid ibn Bashir and he is Da'if also. And even Shaykh al Albani and al Iraqi and others from the ulama have said that these, these, this narration and these chains do not support one another, so therefore the hadith is weak. However, ibn Hajar rahimahullah here uh, and this is what it says here it's been raised in Tabarani the hadith is Da'if here as the editor has also mentioned however the author uh, Ibn Hajar Rahimullah he said he Da'af Yaseer that is a small level of weakness however there is a supporting hadith which helps us to reinforce. However, what seems to be the correct opinion is that hadith is not correct. However, the meaning is correct that the shaitan can influence Bani Adam and that will then distract him from the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created him and to distract him from what would be his protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when that protection is lost, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows for man to attack man and jinn to attack jinn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no concern for what happens to those people who forget him and he leaves them to their own vices and agna shuraka and his shirk. And then the Prophet sallallahu said in his hadith Qudsi, I am the most free from those people who need to be taken as partner. But if they take me as a partner, taraktuhu wa shirku, I leave him and abandon him and I leave the thing that he worships beside me. So what we learn from this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will abandon man and abandon jinn 
and allow them to do what they want with one another if they are influenced by shaitan heavily to the extent that they will then forget their purpose on this page now here this is another narration from Anas bin Malik where he narrates that there was an incident that happened once that I was uh, or there was uh, uh, the daughter of Auf ibn Fra and she had uh, uh, more or less like a phenomenon and a miracle that was granted to her which is that the shayateen tried to attack her and the shayateen tried to infiltrate and uh, etc but she had a level of piety uh, and uh, Aisha radiallahu anha found out about uh, how the shayateen were trying to attack her etc and uh, Aisha radiallahu anha said that she will not be able to be affected or they will not be able to affect her because of her piety and that her father had witnessed Badr uh, there was some weakness in that also, but the point that we learn from this particular chapter here Which is that the point that the author is making is that uh, the the shayateen Can overcome man Whether it's inside Ramadan or outside Ramadan uh, However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect that and people with those characteristics uh, That they have for themselves Now we will finish with this chapter here uh, Like we've said before the author now is going to mention dhikr al hikmah fi taslit al jin al ins bi taun what is the hikmah of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing for the shayateen in a realm that we cannot see to create plagues and pandemics and then those plagues and pandemics have an impact on us and that can then create hardship and even death what is the hikmah behind that the author now quotes Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah in mentioning a few reasons that Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah mentions as to why uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, allows this to happen in his qadr. So Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah says, فِي كَوْنِ الطَّعُونَ وَخْسَ عَدَائِنَا الْجِنْ حِكْمَةٌ بَالِغَةٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing this to happen, there is a clear and a profound wisdom behind of it. And from that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has those people who obey him and those people who disobey him. And the people who obey him from the ins, from mankind, they have a level of disagreement and sometimes even enmity and sometimes that could even result in uh, argumentation or even sometimes war with their fellow human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised those people who support him and defend the truth and justice, etc. And they strive against kufr and ma'asi and fujur and fasad on earth. They strive against sin and corruption and oppression and any kind of, uh, you know, this stabling of the life of, of the people that live on earth. They are the people who obey him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they will always be confronted by those people who want to sin and want to spread oppression and want to spread fitna. As a result of that, there will sometimes be a dialogue, a, sh a harsh dialogue sometimes, and it could even lead to war. And as a result of war, the Prophet wasallam said, For now, ummati, fitta'ni wa ta'un, my ummah will be perished and my ummah will be killed and most of them will die in the state of Ta'an and Ta'un. We mentioned this before. Ta'an refers to them being wounded and killed and injured and then dying as a result of that. And Ta'un refers to plagues and pandemics. So what is the hikmah? Ibn Qayyim Rahimullah is mentioning here. Ta'an and wounding and uh, dying of injury are from the injuries when they are overcome by the humans. But the ta'un is when they are overcome by their enemies from the jinn. Therefore, most of this ummah who have the correct characteristics as the author has mentioned before and he will highlight later on in the book will perish and they will be accepted as being shaheed bi'ibnillah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
as a consequence of them being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so they will then be attacked either by the shayateen from the humans or the shayateen from the jinn. That's one of the hikmah that has been mentioned by Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah. But he also mentions that there is another hikmah, which is that it is the nature of the shayateen from the humans and the shayateen of the jinn that they spread fitna and fasad and corruption on earth. And as a result of the oppression they spread and the injustices they spread, the believers will then be caught up in that and they will die as a consequence of that. So the second hikmah or reason or possible reason that Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says is that this ummah will perish because of the oppression increasing and the injustices increasing and because of that most of the ummah of the Prophet وسلم, will die either because of the consequences of the oppression and the the injustices caused by humans or from their brothers from the jinn and the shayateen. He also mentions as another hikmah ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah dhikru hikmatu ukhra talik bi qismu akhu ghayr min ashar ilayhi ibn al-Qayyim uh, this is not from Ibn Qayyim, this is from Al-Kalabadi in his book Ma'ani Al-Akhbar, Rahimahullah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes who he wants to punish from the people of earth. And there's a separate chapter on this completely, however, what Kalabadi is saying here, Rahimahullah, is that whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to punish, in Allah azza wa jal akhtasab al-mu'min li nafsih, وَصَرَّفَهُ فِي مَحَابِهِ وَجَعَلَ كُلَّ أَحْوَالِ خَيْرًا لَهُ وَأَرَادَ بِهِ الْخَيْرِ فِي كُلِّ مَا أَصَابَهُ مِنْ تَرَّاءٍ وَصَرَّاءٍ وَأَلَمٍ وَلَذَّةٍ And then he goes on to mention, so the point that he's mentioning here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will afflict whatever he wants to afflict mankind with whatever he wants to. However, that affliction and that one action sometimes is a mercy for some, but it will be a punishment for others. And Allah will do as He pleases. But there is another reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows for these plagues to occur from the influence of the shayateen is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to take those people who are truthful as shuhada. And they will not be able to reach the level as being shaheed without it. They will never fight a battle in their life. They will never have the opportunity to die as a shaheed. So this is a rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he sends and allows for the shayateen to do these things. And he allows it to occur within his creation as a way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, elevating the status of those who believe And there's another thing That has been mentioned here By the Shaykh And this has been mentioned by Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allows these to occur As a test for the believers So sometimes you will be tested Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Has mentioned in various places in the Quran that the believers will be tested and that sometimes they will have relief also and they will have victory. Therefore, the believer is within the, the status of being in the state of sabr and shukr always. Either he will have sabr and that will be his default in his life and that is the case for a lot of people. And for some people, it will be shukr, which is the default in their life. However, Allah will alternate for the believers. Allah will alternate for the believers. And Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah says, as a hikmah as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows these pandemics to happen specifically from the attack from the jinn, is so that the believers are then tested between sabr and shukr. However, the author now says that there is another ishkal and there is another... Uh, point that we need to discuss and try and reconcile, which is that why would Allah allow oppressors to overcome those people who are truthful 
why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring about some of these things which are of virtue for the believers, that like we just mentioned here, the pandemic and plague, or a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes some people as being shaheed, which way they wouldn't have attained otherwise. Why does that come about through the hands of oppressors? That's a very important question. Ibn Hajar rahimahullah says, number one, to show weakness to the believers so that they get to know what Nasr and the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually is. You can see that here on the screen. مع أن مع أنه في أكثر أوقاته قد منعه الله منه بالروح تارة وقوة والنصر أخرى. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sometimes will allow for the enemy of the people who are upon خير, and this is to test them if they are going to be consistent on that خير, but also to put them in a state of weakness. And we've we've seen that with the prophets and the best of mankind. Alayhim salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them through weakness, Allah put them through tests to the extent that the Prophet was almost killed by the oppressors. However, when the Nasr of Allah came and the power of Allah could be seen, it was then accepted and appreciated by the believers and that increased them in their virtue and it increased them in their reward, and for some of them it increased them in their iman. And here the author is bringing some of the ayat which talk about that. وَأَنْتُمْ alone وَلَنْ يَجَلَ اللَّهُ لِلْكَافِرِينَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ السَّبِيلَ Allah will not make it as a way of the kuffar and the oppressors and the shayateen to overcome the believers. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows that to happen to raise the status of the believers so that the believers will attain for themselves what the shayateen cannot stop and the very opposite of what they are trying to achieve but at the same time the believers will then see the Nasr of Allah Jalla Sha'nu and they will see the strength given to the people of Iman and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts a stop to the the, the oppression of the oppressors or the oppression of the oppressors and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about defeat for those people who have been oppressing for a long period of time and the believers can see it in front of them with the Ayn al-Yaqeen and the Haqq al-Yaqeen. So this is very important because we are living in a world where there is a lot of oppression and the believers have been patient for a very long time. And like we have mentioned before, the believers are those people who have certain characteristics. It cannot be that a person is complaining about Palestine and Burma and all these different Kashmir and Delhi and all these things and he continues in his life heedless He continues in his life in a manner where he is not changing a day goes by and he's exactly the same Perhaps even worse than the day that went before Despite the fact that he's moving closer to his grave and then when something happens He says look Allah is punishing the people in China for what they're doing to the Uyghurs. Look X, X Y and Z is happening Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, in today's lecture, one of the things that we need to understand very firm from what we have read with the pages today is saying here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give victory and a reward and an expiation to people with certain characteristics. And you need to make sure that you have those characteristics. Another thing that we have learned from today's uh, lessons is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will foil the plot of those people who want to spread corruption and he will fulfill his favor upon those people who want to do khair and the example that we've seen is of the month of Ramadan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chains up the shayateen and he prevents them from attacking the believers so that the believers can attain the full reward of Ramadan in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from them but also what we have learned from today's chapters is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a hikmah behind allowing these things to happen and from that is that the believer is elevated and the believer sees the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of him but again all of this is not independent from one another he has to be of those people who have those characteristics and before we finish the author then goes on to say rahimahullah 
that another reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows for the oppressors to create the oppression so that the believers are then afflicted by it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants a good end for some like we've mentioned before Allah wants a good end for some which they cannot be gained except through these pandemics This is despite the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the case of shaitan the plots of shaitan are feeble they are weak and they can be repelled with the most consistent and the most simplest of athkar with ikhlas and mutaba. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows these things to happen and he allows for the shayateen to overcome the believer despite the fact that he may be doing some of the things that he should be doing and it would qualify him to have that protection. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows that to happen so that he attains for himself something which is of a greater good that he could not have attained in any other way. So to conclude, he says Khatima from this particular chapter and these few masa'al that we've looked at today, the hadith which talk about the plague can be from the jinn and there are plenty of evidences from that. As we can see what he is saying here. Another point that we need to conclude with is that in the previous chapters, the, the Shaykh Ibn Hajar Hafiz Allah has established those a hadith that these ta'un come from the shayateen, or is a possibility that they come from the shayateen. Nobody really knows categorically except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, if it is from the shayateen, we have now learned what their meanings are and we have answered some of the queries and uh, the issues that needed to be discussed and reconciled with. And we have looked at that in the previous session and in this session some of them also. But he ends with an incident here which is full of Ibra and reminder and lessons. He said and he's saying here about himself that let me just scroll up here وَقَدْ وَرَدْ أَثَرَكَ I don't know what he talks about uh, concluding with what we've just concluded with but he said that there is an incident that happened in Qahira which is Cairo and what happened was that there was a plague and during this plague, there was a man who was a pious man. He wanted to visit a person who had been afflicted by an illness. And whilst he was going to visit the person, he wanted to visit the, the sick person. Whilst he was on his way to visit the sick person, he heard a voice or two voices behind him. One voice was saying, shall I hit him? Shall I hit him? And the other voice was saying, La, don't, don't hit him. Perhaps he's going to go and he's going to benefit people. Don't hit him. Then the other voice said back to the person who said, don't hit him. Of course he will. He's going to benefit people. Meaning, if we let him go, then he will go ahead and benefit people. So then the other voice said to him, then hit him or hit his horse for fi ain farasihi hit the eye of his horse but don't hit him so the person who was going to visit the sick person when he had those voices behind him altafatu fala ara ahada i turned around and i couldn't find it i didn't see anyone fa'utu al marid wa raja'at he goes I, I continued on my journey as normal i visited the sick person and then i went on my way back home and as I was going back to my house for al Faras I saw a horse that had been injured and it was lying on the side and the people had surrounded the horse and they were looking for the person who the horse belonged to so there was like a car accident if you like and the people were surrounded this horse and they couldn't find the driver or the owner of the horse and as he got closer and he inspected the horse he had seen that the horse had been injured in its eye like he had previously heard 
without any clear reason. There was no piercing, there was no uh, wound, there was no weapon that could be seen. He had clearly been injured in his eye with a severe injury. I mean, you can probably imagine a horse being, you know, disabled in that manner. Uh, it would be a very stern blow to his eye. So the horse had been injured, but there was no clear reason, there was no clear indication. غير أثري ضربة ظاهرة There was no clear understanding as to why this had happened. So the person, Ibn Hajar, had been narrated to with this story, said, فَتَحَقَّقْتُ صِدْكَ مَنْقُولْ أَنَّ الطَّعُونَ مِنْ وَخْسِ الْجِنْ I then researched the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, in saying that, that these plagues and these illnesses are an attack from the jinn and when I researched I was am- amazed by the truthfulness in it. وَكَانَ indi فِي ذَلِكُ And for me this became a great reminder and a life turning point for him. May Allah allow us to benefit from his religion and that he accepts us for everything that we do whether it's big or small whether it's complete or deficient and inshallah what we will do in the next session look at the second segment of the book where it says Al-Fasl of thamin but for me this is the second segment of the book where he says Dhikra Athar Warida Fi Adhkarlati Narrations which have been narrated from the Adhkar, which will protect a person who says them in Kedil Jinn from the plots of the Jinn. We ask Allah that He protects us and He grants Iman in ourselves and in our homes and in our communities, and that He accepts a promise and that He allows us to get closer to Him and that He takes us in a state of goodness.